everyone for joining the webinar today. This talk was originally prepared in conjunction with the AGS, but was thought to be relevant to FAME members as well. Um, no doubt some of you will be familiar with some of what we will cover, but I hope that it will serve as a useful reminder and also give some practical guidance that will assist you in your negotiations with clients and third parties. Essentially, whenever you receive a request for a collateral warranty, a letter of reliance, or a request to assign the benefit of your report or any other work product, alarm bells should ring. And today, I hope to explain why that is and what steps you can take to protect your position in those circumstances. Um, so I hope to have a firstly have a brief, brief look at the significance of collateral warranties and, and assignments, and then take a look at the safeguards that ought to feature in the contracts with your original client in order to limit your liability. Um, and then we'll look at the specific considerations for the various methods by which third parties can be granted contractual rights. And then I'll end with a few words about current trends. So what is all the fuss about and why are we talking about commercial warranties and other methods of assignment? Why are they important? Um, well, this is because as a matter of law, most losses that occur in relation to construction projects, for example, losses caused by delay, interruption, cost of redesign, etc., are classified as economic loss. And those losses are not recoverable in tort. This means that unless you have entered into a contract with the party who suffered that loss, they cannot recover those losses from you. In each case, signing a collateral warranty or writing a letter, giving someone permission to rely on your report, or in some other way, assigning, which means transferring, the benefit of a report to a third party, creates a contract with that person and thereby gives them the ability to sue you for economic loss. So as we will see, granting a collateral warranty, even if carefully drafted, will usually at least double your exposure to risk. Letters of reliance and assignment of reports, if they tend to be less formal, and the usual limitations of liability are more likely to be forgotten, can expose you to even greater risks. Your insurers will look carefully at these contracts and whether the types and the extent of the losses you're now exposed to are covered by your professional insurance insurance. So let's start by looking at fundamental ways of limiting liability um, in your original terms of appointment or your original contract with your client, as these will set useful parameters which can then be mirrored in any subsequent contracts with third parties. First and foremost, limit your liability with a financial cap. A reasonable aggregate cap on your liability under the appointment is essential to protect you in the event of a claim. An aggregate cap means, for example, subject to a limit of £300,000 for all such claims, as opposed to each and every claim. This then prevents your client from making multiple claims of £300,000. Another thing to watch out for is carve-outs for certain types of loss or certain scenarios. These are exceptions to the caps on liability, which might be given away in other clauses. As you probably know, any clause that aims to limit liability uh, must pass the test for reasonableness. Um, and each case um, depends on the individual circumstances. Um, things that the courts will often look at when determining whether the limitation is reasonable is the level of your fee, as it's reasonable to assume that the parties know that there is a trade-off between the level of risk that you assume and the fee that you paid. They'll also look at the nature of the work you're doing, they'll look at the nature of the experience and understanding of your client, whether they're a commercial entity or private individual, for example, and they'll look at the availability of insurance for that type of loss. And of course, any limitation clause must be drafted using clear, unambiguous language. Um, recently, we've seen that professionals have been put off from seeking a financial cap on liability that is any lower than their professional indemnity cover, believing that such a cap would be unenforceable, and that is simply not the case. The case I've referred to there in the slide, Good Life Foods and Hall Fire Protection, uh, provides a useful illustration. Um, in this case, the defendant was a specialist fire suppression contractor. Their standard terms and conditions excluded all liability arising from the negligence. 
um, provided that they would only replace faulty components free of charge. Alternatively, they were willing to provide insurance to cover risk at an extra cost if that was requested. And the courts held that this was a reasonable clause that was not particularly unusual or onerous. The circumstances that the court considered relevant were that the defendant's fee had been modest, the terms were agreed between two commercial parties with equal bargaining power, wider liability had been offered but not requested, the defendant had no maintenance obligations, and the loss claimed arise from a fire, sorry, arose from a fire that occurred 10 years after the contractor had actually completed his work. So it's a very helpful case that shows that courts are willing to uphold a modest cap on liability. Um, even more worrying is that some people believe that provided the contract refers to the limits of their profession then to cover, they're not exposed to liability any greater than that figure. This too is incorrect. A fundamental point to remember is that the level of your professional indemnity insurance is not a limit of liability, either by implication or otherwise. Uh, this means, for example, if you've undertaken to maintain cover of two million, your client could nevertheless sue you and you could be held liable for a much greater sum. So only two million would be insured, the rest of it would fall to your company. So all appointments should include an express limit of liability, separate to the statement as to the level of insurance that you've been maintaining. Next, your appointment should include a net contribution clause. Um, where there are other parties who are also liable to your client, a net contribution clause limits your liability to paying a fair share of the loss suffered by the client on the assumption that the other parties have also paid their fair share. So this clause reverses the common law position, um, which is known as joint and several liability. And that means that the client can recover the whole of its loss from any one of several parties who are liable for causing that loss, leaving that particular party to then seek contribution from the other party. So having a net contribution clause places onto the client the risk and the cost burden of pursuing multiple parties. And it also means that if any of those parties are insolvent, the client also carries that risk. These are fairly standard nowadays, and insurers will expect to see them in, uh, in your appointments as well. Next, um, try to exclude liability for indirect and consequential losses. This prevents you from being responsible for losses which are far removed from your services. Um, so you might limit the types of loss to something that is foreseeable um, should you fail to perform your contract. Um, in some cases, it might be the reasonable cost of remediation, for example. Uh, another must is a time limit on the period of your liability. Clients tend to draft these limitation clauses on the basis that the limitation period starts to run from the date of practical completion of the project. However, practical completion may never occur if, for example, there's an early termination or for, for many other reasons. Um, and it also could be you know, many, many years after you've completed your services. So uh, limitation clauses should be amended to allow a period of either six or 12 years from the earlier date of either practical completion or the date of the last performance of your services or the termination of your contract. And to make sure that all claims are captured within that liability limitation period, um, it's important that um, express words are used to refer to all claims and not just claims under this contract, which would only pr prevent um, contractual claims rather than, for example, claims in tort or breach of statutory duty, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, do watch out for indemnities. These tend to be inconsistent with your professional indemnity insurance as they allow the indemnified party to recover all of its losses uh, on a pound-for-pound -pound basis. So without having to meet usual tests at law 
know, of reasonableness, proportionality, and so on. So indemnities are a significant risk as well. So let's now look at how your appointment should deal with granting rights to third parties, which is what we're concerned about here today. So it is standard nowadays um, that uh, your contract would include uh, a clause that expressly prohibits assignment of your liabilities without your prior consent and would also exclude um, third party rights under the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act. So without that, ex without that prohibition, your client could assign the benefits of that contract at any time to anyone without your consent um, and need only notify you after the event that he's done so. Um, so just worth checking that that's in there. It, you know, it's pretty standard, it shouldn't be uh, controversial. And then what would happen is your client will usually insert a requirement uh, in your appointment to provide collateral warranties to certain parties. So they might insert a clause and like one shown on the slide. The consultant shall provide, upon a request, a collateral warranty in the terms contained in Appendix 2 in favour of any purchaser, any tenant, or any funder. Um, we've seen them drafted wider as well, so it could be to any party with an interest in the project. So how should you respond when you see a clause like that? Obviously, we would always advise you to avoid providing collateral warranties wherever possible. But if that's not possible, please do limit your obligation to a closely defined group of people. So instead of any purchaser, it would be the first purchaser and tenant would be the first tenant and that sort of thing. And a cap should be provided to the total number of collateral warranties that you are obliged to grant to a maximum of three. So um, now that we've looked at the risk mitigation provisions that should be included in your appointment, let's move on to take a look at contracts with third parties. These can take a number of forms, but let's start with collateral warranties, which is the most formal. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, the collateral warranty is a contract where you warrant to a third party, i.e. someone other than your original client, that you've complied with the terms of your original appointment contract. So collateral warranties are used to create direct contractual links between uh, yourselves and third parties without which those third parties would be unable to recover any economic loss, such as loss of rent, for example. And it means that if your client, your, your original employer, uh, goes bust, they can sue you directly. So collateral warranties create new liability in addition to your liability to the original client. So if your limit of liability under your appointment is one million, and you agree to mirror that, in the collateral warranty, your total potential liability increases to two million. So that's another reason why it's important to set a reasonable limit in your appointment in the first place. As it's a contract in its own right, the third party beneficiary of this collateral warranty can also assign, that means transfer, the benefit of that contract to others on the terms set out in the collateral warranty meaning you need to include the same safeguards within the collateral warranty as we discussed um, for your original appointment. So looking at the form and content of the collateral warranties themselves, um, you'll often be asked to agree the wording of the collateral warranty at the same time as you enter into your appointment and the copy will be appended to your appointment. So it's important to look at the terms of the collateral warranty just as closely as you would your initial terms of appointment. It's a contract in its own right, so you need to exclude third party rights and provide that assignment should require prior consent and be limited. If you're providing a collateral warranty to a funder, assignment should be limited to one other company providing finance in connection with the project. If it's a collateral warranty to a tenant or a purchaser, 
the number of assignments should generally be limited to one or two occasions only, um, and that should be fairly uncontroversial. And uh, next, your obligations under the clash of warranty should be back to back with your appointments, so that the duties and standard of care required are no more onerous than in your appointments. And the clash of warranty should contain an express clause limiting your liability by reference to your uh, original appointment. So these clauses uh, include uh, a no greater or longer lasting liability clause stating that you cannot owe the beneficiary of the class of warranty any greater duties than you would owe to your client, and an equivalent right of defence clause, which provides that you may use any defence under your appointment, which, it would have, which you would have against your original client, to defend a claim from the beneficiary under the class of warranty. So, um, you can rely on all your usual, all the limits of liability set out in the appointment. You can count, have any counterclaim or unpaid fees and so on. And the case of Swansea Stadium refers there on the slide is an example of the court enforcing a more greater liability clause. And in that case, um, practical completion was certified on 31st of March 2005. The contractor provided a collateral warranty to the tenant sometime after that. This contained a clause expressly limiting the contractor's liability to that which it would have had if the claimant had been named as joint employer, meaning that liability to the tenant for defects in the original works would run no longer than 12 years from practical completion, not from the date the collateral warranty was signed. The court upheld that clause meaning that the claim that had been issued was four days late and was struck out in its entirety. So um, a good example of how useful these uh, limitations can be. Um, any clash of warranty with a funder will usually include step-in provisions, um, which allows the funder to take over your original appointment in circumstances where, for example, your um, employers have gone into liquidation and the funder has terminated its finance agreement. Um, that's fairly standard. It's also fairly standard and, and we, we would say essential that that right to step in should be made subject to payment of any unpaid fees that are due to you. Um, as it's likely that your original employer will have gone into equation and you will be paid some fees. Um, any collateral warranty, we would want to see an exclusion for uh, any consequential losses, such as loss of profit. Um, the losses suffered by the nature of the parties who um, are the beneficiaries of the collateral warranty are likely to be of a type and extent that your original client would not have suffered. For example, um, loss of rent, uh, business interruption, and so on. Um, so we would want to, to see those excluded. And uh, finally, um, and I suppose an overriding point, is that um, it's essential to check that um, any collateral warranty that you agree to is covered by your professional identity insurance. Um, PI policies typically will not provide cover if you are committed to any greater liability than you would be under your appointment, uh, or if the collateral warranty has been assigned on more than two occasions. Some uh, insurance policies contain additional specific restrictions on the scope of cover applicable to collateral warranties or third party rights. So it's also, it's, it's always a good idea to ask your insurer or your broker to consider any class of warranty you're being asked to sign and um, just to confirm whether there are any sort of um, uninsured uh, losses. Yeah. The Construction Industry Council also publishes uh, a really helpful standard form class of warranty, um, which uh, is good to have on hand um, so that you can offer it as an alternative if the standard form that the client's putting forward is not, uh, is not accessible. 
moving on now to um, consider another common scenario in which contracts with third parties are created. Um, this most commonly occurs in circumstances where a consultant has completed a report or some other work product for their original client, could be uh, the original landowner, for example, and is later asked to assign the benefit of that report to a third party, for example, a developer who's purchasing the site. Without a collateral warranty or some other formal assignment of the benefit of the report, a third party may read your report and make use of the information it contains. They can even ask questions about it, but they have no legal right to rely on that information and to bring a claim against you if it's wrong and you suffer a loss. This was confirmed in the case of BDW trading. Um, in this case, uh, the vendor of the site commissioned um, Integral Geotechnic, I'll call them IGL, to produce a ground investigation report, which was to be included in the packs uh, sent out to potential purchasers, which included BDW. Sensibly, IGL's standard terms and conditions excluded third party rights. Um, uh, and provided nothing in this contract confers or purports to confer any third party benefit or any rights to enforce any terms of this contract. However, IGL sent their report to the vendor under cover of a letter which stated, we confirm that the attached may be assigned to the site purchaser and onto two further parties. So IGL envisaged and acknowledged that the benefit of their report would be assigned. BDW put queries to IGL regarding some aspects of their report and subsequently purchased the site in May 2014. However, they did not at any point request or receive a formal assignment of the benefit of the report, nor did they seek any legal document from IGL to permit their reliance on it. After purchase, when the groundworks were underway, extensive asbestos contamination was discovered beneath certain areas of the site. BDW sought damages for the cost of the asbestos remediation from IGL. So BDW hadn't taken an assignment and therefore had no contractual claim against IGL. BDW therefore sought to argue that IGL owed it a duty of care in tort on the basis that IGL knew that BDW had received a copy of their report and that they had read and relied on it when purchasing the site. The judge held that the assignment statement, that's the um, statement in the covering letter which accompanied the report, when read together in the context of the contract, made it reasonably clear to BDW that if it wanted to place legal reliance on the report, it would have to obtain an assignment or other legal document from IGL in order to do so. The judge also drew a clear distinction between a purchaser using the report in the sense of reading it, asking questions, even making decisions based on it, and relying on it in the sense of having a legal right to do so and to recover damages. IGL's knowledge that a third party was using their report did not give rise to a duty of care and did not do so where IGL had provided the report on the understanding that a third party could not rely on the report without taking an assignment. And we have seen uh, numerous cases that arise out of similar circumstances where unfortunately the consultant has been asked um, by the purchaser of the site to uh, assign the benefit of the report to them by way of a letter or something like that. Um, and that was sufficient to create a contract. Um, and without that, the claim against them would not have got off the ground. So retrospectively, assigning the benefit of an existing report to a third party um, can be achieved in a number of ways. Um, you might be asked to write a letter of assignment. Sometimes they're called letters of reliance. You might even just be asked to readdress the report, changing the client's name to this third party. And these requests often sort of seem innocuous and you know they don't take long to do. Um, and you can charge a fee. So sometimes it seems as easy money. Um, 
but you know, they really are not. They are giving rise to significant commercial risks and creating onerous contractual liabilities to third parties. Um, and <clears throat> furthermore, um, these methods of assignment, because they're less formal and, and tend to be less considered than collateral warranty, the usual safeguards that we outlined above tend to be overlooked, um, meaning that the scope of the liability created is, can be significantly greater. There's also the added risk that some considerable time may have passed since the report was prepared and site conditions may have changed significantly um, so that the contents of the report are actually no longer applicable. Um, so there comes a point where you think you know, it's still appropriate for us to be giving an assignment of a report of a certain age. Um, another risk is that these letters of reliance are often worded as if the third party was the original client. And the same effect is achieved if you simply just readdress your report. Um, the difficulty with this is that the third party may have quite different requirements um, or interest those of your original client and you might have included different advice or placed more emphasis on certain elements of your report if it had been written to that third party at the outset. This um, difference of emphasis was acknowledged in the BBW case. The judge highlighted the importance of achieving the purpose for which the report had originally been obtained. Um, in that case, IGL's report was prepared for the vendor of the site, so it wouldn't have been appropriate for them to emphasise hypothetical or unquantifiable risks, um, particularly where it was not instructed to advise prospective purchasers whether or not to buy the site. Um, given that they were instructed by the vendor of the site, they certainly wouldn't be expected to elevate hypothetical risks as far as the result of the actual site investigation. Um, so for that reason, um, request to change the name of the client referred to in the report or, or treat them as somehow having been the original client should be firmly um, resisted. Clearly, the way to ensure the least exposure to risk is not to assign reports at all uh, and instead to offer to prepare a new report for the new client. However, that's obviously not always commercially acceptable or even practical. So um, what then can be done to reduce your exposure? Firstly, do include disclaimers in your actual report or some other work product. Um, these have been held uh, to be useful in, in limiting uh, or at least informing the reliance that a client might place on the report and specifically excluding reliance by third parties. The client can show the report to whoever they like for information, but the disclaimer in the report itself reinforces the point that no duty of care arises to those other parties. Those caveats or disclaimers should be set out at the beginning of your report, before the executive summary and in plain language. Um, in the case of BDW, the claimant tried to argue that the caveats and disclaimers that had been included in RGL's report were just sort of bog standard routine things that were included and therefore didn't have any effect. Um, but the um, court held otherwise. And um, in that case, IGL's report contained the usual wa warning that contamination may be localised and ground investigation necessarily limited to specific points on the site. So there may be areas of contamination that exist that have not been found. Um, so even though this was acknowledged as a standard caveat that appears in pretty much any decent report, the judge agreed that it was entirely appropriate, personal and effective. Secondly, we would advise you to have a protocol in place within your company and a standard letter or a standard form that you can use whenever you receive a request to assign a report. Um, these requests are often presented as urgent, perhaps they form part of uh, 
sale and purchase agreement or some other transaction. Remember, the power is very much in your hands at this point. You have something that they want. Um, so, as I said before, any suggestion that the report is to be treated as if it had originally been prepared for that party should be resisted. Um, and your standard form that you have to hand, your standard agreement to assign, should uh, include a number of provisions. Firstly, that any further assignment of the report is absolutely prohibited. Uh, you want a limitation uh, period um, that is no longer than six years from the date the report was prepared, not the date of the actual assignment. Um, the assignee may want a limitation of 12 years, for example, if your original contract was as a deed, but you're not obliged to agree to this. And given that this request is coming you know, sometime later, there's actually no um, true rationale for it to be a 12 year period. Um, there should also be a provision that the adequacy of your performance in preparing that report should be assessed by reference to the standards that were prevailing at the time the report was prepared, the terms of your original appointment, and the instructions and information provided by your original client. Uh, it should also include a clause which provides that no liability will arise from any changes to site conditions since the report was prepared. You might also have something similar within the report itself. And there should be an express financial cap on liability, of course, and as we've discussed at the very beginning, exclude liability for consequential losses and um, have an equivalent rights of defence and more greater liability clauses. And finally, price the risk. Uh, again, you have something that they want. Um, the power is in your hand. Um, have a look, have a think about uh, the type of report that you're providing, the age of the report, um, the size of the site, the size of any financial cap on liability, and crucially, the nature of the person or party that you're assigning to. For example, uh, is it a national house builder with the resources to be, the reputation for being an aggressive litigant? Um, they're likely to represent a far greater risk um, than the, your original client, for example. So perhaps have a sliding scale of fees that you would um, charge in those circumstances have that you know as a protocol within your firm or company so that you can um, deal with all that promptly. Okay, so um, just to end on a note about recent trends, as you're probably all aware, the insurance market is um, hardening, um, which means that it is even more important that you do stand your ground in negotiations with clients and third parties. Um, generally, clients expect your limits of liability to be the same as your PI cover, uh, but that is simply not appropriate. This will not be your only project. You might have a claim on another project which erodes that limit. And it may simply be disproportionate to the size of the fee that you're um, receiving. Um, so often a, a good way of arriving at an appropriate limit of liability of financial cap would be to have a multiple of your fee, be it 10 times or 20 times. Um, and that's likely to be a lot less than the limit of your profession identity insurance. Um, similarly, net contribution clauses, they are enforceable, they avoid deep pocketing whereby your client or third party chooses to pursue the solvent insured professional for 100% of the loss and leaving it to them to, to seek contribution from other parties. And um, your insurers will expect to see um, net contribution clauses. All of these limits of liability, net contribution clauses, exclusion clauses, caveats in your reports, they are enforceable by the courts. 
um, and also the need for a formal assignment to a third party to rely on your report also being confirmed. So um, law is very much on your side. Um, another note would be to, to use the resources available to you, your insurer, your broker. We have an in-house contract review service as well if, you're, if you need something looked at. So um, do refer to the resources um, that are available to you. Um, to look at these contracts that you're being asked to sign. So that concludes my talk and only remains for me to thank you for listening.